Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson and I'm here with the 11th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Last time we were talking about the dilemma. The dilemma is a Greek word and it means a logical structure with two extreme points of view. Yes and no, true and false, right and wrong, saved and sinner. <laughs> this is called Aristotelian logic, logic that has only two truth values. Now the problem is when we start dealing with problems or questions about being, is that being is not so easily discussed uh, in terms of black and white. There are two extreme notions, being and non-being, existence or non-existence, either something is or it is not. These are extreme points of view, and they lead to all kinds of logical quandaries, difficulties in understanding the way things are because the way things are isn't quite so simple. Even in the Vedic time, before the appearance of the Buddha, this was a big problem. And the uh, Chandogya Upanishad, for example, says, how could being come out of non-being? If in the beginning there was nothing, then how did things come to be? This is a big problem because this Aristotelian logic, two-valued logic, black and white, sees things as either existing or not existing. It does not take into account the actuality of nature, which if we look at everything that is, especially living beings, in nature they go through a process of becoming. It's not that one minute there's nothing and the next minute things pop into existence out of nowhere. This is a conception, or actually a misconception, that is only possible because of the limitations of our language and our logic. So as long as we perceive being and non-being to be a dilemma yeah, of only two possibilities, we're going to get it wrong. The Buddha went back to the beginning. He he totally reinvestigated the problem of being, of existence. And he came up with the middle way that at all times and in all cases, things are becoming. They're always changing. Either they're growing or declining. Either they're taking birth or they're dying. In either case, they're in a process of constant change constant becoming, constant movement from this condition to that condition over time. And this is how the Buddha solved the difficulty of the problem of existence. Earlier solutions, including the Vedas, for example, said in the, in the beginning there was neither being nor non-being. And maybe only the Creator, maybe only God can understand it. So this was a way of putting the problem off <laughs> into another world, kicking the can down the road, as it said, and uh, giving God the problem. Well, good, then we don't have to deal with it. <laughs> Only we do. Because we also are involved in this question of being or non-being. Famously, Hamlet spoke his soliloquy, to be or not to be. That is the question. Yet, it's not so simple. It's more like there's a scale of being and non-being. And really, being and non-being are only in terms of our labels, of our categories, of our ontology. And if our ontology is based on binary logic, either something is or it isn't, then we're going to have a bad time. Because nature deals in fractional quantities of being all the time. 
when a child is born, we say, okay, he is, he exists. But then when he dies, we say, oh, then he's not. But wait a minute. Before the child is born, he was an egg and a sperm who came together and then developed gradually in the womb of the mother. And even after the moment that we call death, the body is still there. All the chemicals, everything that was necessary for life is still present. Only something is missing, but still the rest is there. Why do we say the birth is the beginning of life, the beginning of existence of this being, and death is the end? It's actually a gradual process, a gradual process of becoming. And birth simply marks a milestone in that process. Similarly, death is part of the process of degeneration, old age, disease, the disintegration of the body. At some point, the being says, oh, this body is worthless. This is useless. I'm not going to stay here anymore and begins a new cycle of becoming. But we don't see that. We only see that the being has vacated this particular body, this particular embodiment or shell. And we don't see that we are engaged in a process of becoming our whole life long. What happens to that baby once he comes out of the womb? Gradually he grows and becomes an infant and then a child and then a young rascal, <laughs> then an adolescent and an adult. And finally he becomes middle-aged and then old and then he dies. And then the body gradually disintegrates. So there's a gradual process of becoming going on continually. And in that process, we change from one type of being to another. It's not that we are ever non-being. We're always being. <laughs> and the process of becoming is the means of manifesting our being. Therefore, the Buddha came up with the process of becoming paticca samuppada, the middle way, the middle path. Now, why people mistake this idea of the middle path for uh, some kind of compromise of morals and ethics? They say, well, actually, Buddha's middle path means that, you know, I can drink a little or I can smoke a little or I can do a little bad things, as long as I'm not really, really bad. Yeah, I don't have to be really, really good either. And I can still maintain my being. How did this interpretation get started? It's because people took the Buddha's teaching as religion, as morality, as one of these fixed things. But it's not. The Buddha's teaching is a dynamic process, and the core of that process is paticca samuppada, dependent origination, or dependent arising. And the principle of dependent arising is called specific causality. That is, when this is, that is. When this arises, that arises along with it. And when this is not, that is not. When this is gone, that thing disappears as well. This is specific causality, and it is the core of the Buddha's teaching. Not that saying this is or this is not is the ultimate. No, it's that this is becoming due to such and such cause or causes. And actually, if we look at the process of paticca samuppada, which we will in a future episode, we see it's a gradual process with many stages, each one depending on the previous as the cause. So this also gives the key to enlightenment, because if we can remove the original cause, the whole chain collapses like a string of dominoes. So there's a lot of thought been invested in this idea of either being or non-being, either something is or is not, either something is true or false. The Buddha used a much more sophisticated process of logic called the tetralemma. 
instead of a dilemma of either right or wrong. The tetralemma has four logic conditions, or actually five, that uh, either something is, this one is right and that one is wrong, or that one is wrong and this one is right, or neither, or both. And then there's the ambiguous case that doesn't fall into any categories. So the Buddha's logic is much more sophisticated than the uh, Western logic. But even then, he had to say that the, the real solution to the problem of being is beyond logic entirely, beyond language completely. For example, there's a famous sutta in which the Buddha refutes the idea of the Tathagata's existence or non-existence after death. A uh, renunciant asked the Buddha, does the Tathagata exist after death? Or does he not exist after death? And then he thought he was going to be really smart and pose the question as a tetralemma. Does he exist after death? Does he not exist after death? Or does he both exist and non-exist? Or does he neither exist nor not exist after death? And the Buddha waved the question away. He said, this question is invalid. And he used the fire simile that we've been discussing in the previous episodes to illustrate why this is so. He pointed out that when a fire goes out with the exhaustion of its fuel, it's absurd to ask whether the fire still exists or not. All that one can say is that the fire is gone. It's gone out. We can't say that it's gone east, west, north, or south. In a similar way, we can't say that after death or after the uh, completion of the manifestation of the Tathagata, then he's going here or he's going there. The question is absurd. The question is just absurd as saying when a fire goes out, it means that fire doesn't exist anymore. No, no. That particular instance of fire has ceased. That's all. It doesn't mean that fire as a whole is gone. There is no more fire. That's a very extreme attitude. And in the same way, it doesn't make any sense to say that a person like the Buddha exists or doesn't exist. Either one. Both of those uh, extreme views are illusory and false because the tetralemma even uh, cannot contain the proper answer to this question. The Buddha says, it comes to be reckoned as gone out. In other words, we, we can reckon a fire. We can calculate the existence or non-existence of a fire. We can say the fire is growing or the fire is diminishing or the fire is gone out. But we cannot say the same thing about fire in general. Similarly, we can't say whether the Buddha exists or doesn't exist, because a being like that is very, very different from a mundane, ordinary being. When the Buddha says that the fire is reckoned as gone out, this is just a worldly usage. It's just an idiom. It's just a construction of language. It's not to be taken too literally. It's not to be taken that this is the absolute truth. It can't, because language can only express relative truths. And in this way, it is impossible to express absolutes such as the nature of the Tathagata or the nature of Nibbana. In the Sutta Nipata, we find, like the flame blown out by the force of the wind reaches its end, it cannot be reckoned. Just so, the sage, free from the mental body, goes to rest and can no longer be discerned. And the questioner continues, the one who has come to rest, is he then nothing? Or is he actually eternally healthy? 
Please explain this to me, O sage, for this teaching has been understood by you. And the Buddha replies, There is no measure of the one who has come to rest. There is nothing by which they can speak of him when everything has been completely removed. All the pathways for speech are also completely removed. This is very deep. We talked about name and form and how Nibbana simply means the decoupling of name from form and form from name. In other words, it means the absence of the mental body. The mental body is the uh, body of name and form, the background, <clears throat> the ontology by which we measure our existence. Are we doing okay? Are we not doing okay? Are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Does this exist? Does that exist? Is this real or is that unreal? See, our ontology, our background knowledge, our model of the world and how it works is how we determine these questions. And they're not always easy to determine, but still we have to have some idea of these things for practical reasons in life. However, when it comes to philosophy, and especially when it comes to the description of a being like the Buddha who has attained Nibbana, or even an Arhat for that matter, he says language is useless because the Arhat or the Buddha has gone beyond all pathways for language. How are we going to measure something if there's no dimension? If there's no length, height, width, depth, time, change, or size, how are we going to measure anything? How are we going to say anything about it? We can't say that it's here or there. There is no location. There is nothing by which we can compare the existence of the Tathagata within this mundane world. He's not in the world. He's not out of the world either. He isn't anywhere. This is a very difficult point. And really it can only be understood by a person who has practiced, who has gone uh, through up, up the ladder of the jhanas and reached the top and taken the leap into the vast abyss. This is Nibbana. Now, I want to say something about meditation practice. If all this is true, and I assert that it is based on my experience, then why are people following rigid methods of meditation based on verbal and intellectual constructs? Well, the reason is that in the beginning, those constructs serve as a kind of map that get you started. Okay, The danger is that we come to rely on those constructs, that we become attached to them. The Buddha says that one of the characteristics of a monk who has attained stream entry is that he is no longer attached to rules and rituals. That would also apply to rigid verbal constructs or intellectual concepts of meditation or Nibbana. So then why are we talking so much about Nibbana? Why are we making so many words about something that's ultimately beyond them? And the answer is we have to start someplace. We have to have a platform on which to meditate, on which to begin this process. But I'm here to tell you that at the end of this process, it goes completely beyond words, beyond methods, beyond rules, beyond everything. So this is the point. When you practice, when you meditate, 
Don't be attached to a specific process. You will notice that if you just sit down and bring mindfulness in front of you and sit with that, things happen by themselves. There's nothing that we need to do. Well, we don't have to go through the checklist of the 32 parts of the body. We don't have to count the breaths. We don't have to do anything except be aware and be aware of our awareness. That's all. And you'll notice this is very hard to do, especially in the beginning. The mind keeps jumping and we keep getting distracted with thoughts and feelings and desires and all kinds of stuff. Well, that's good. That's good because now you're seeing actually what a mess the mind is. And the idea of meditation is to simply sit there and let it settle. The Buddha says the mind is luminous. The mind is luminous by its very nature. The problem is we fill it up with all kinds of junk. And that obscures its luminosity. That fills up its clarity with a bunch of distracting nonsense. Just sit. Don't try to do anything. Don't try to follow any method. All the best results I've got from meditation in my life, and I've had some pretty impressive results, <laughs> have been when I let go of any method and just explored. Just play. Just sit there and wait and let things happen. Like the Zen people say, the spring comes and the grass grows all by itself. There's no need to force anything, no need to push anything, no need to try to make anything happen. Uh, things are going to happen. Don't worry. They certainly are. But not because we're doing them. Because the mind is luminous by nature and Nibbana is our natural state. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta